What's up, everybody? I am super excited because today I am talking to Tim Akers. How you doing, Tim? Super well, thanks. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank, thanks so much for joining me today. So if you have read any Malfoy lore in the last handful of years, you've almost certainly encountered some of Tim's writing. Um, he is an author who writes his own independent stuff. He also has been writing for Weird since about late second edition, I think. Does that sound right? Uh, my first work for them was for The Other Side. And then, uh, yeah, late second edition, I want to say, um, I can't remember the exact, Shifting Allegiance, Shifting Loyalties, I think. Yeah. So one of my. Yeah, I'll, I'll put a list in the okay. in the description so folks can, can see everything that you've worked on because it will be relevant. Um, but most recently, you wrote Ashes of Malifaux, which at the time of recording this, it came out two weeks ago. There you go. So that's extremely exciting. Now, for the benefit of the audience, um, what we're going to do here is, because I know a lot of folks haven't gotten their hands on the book yet, um, or haven't and haven't gotten a chance to dig through it all the way yet. So what we're going to do is we're going to hold off on spoilers for Ashes until the towards the end, and I will put some notation, I'll put a timestamp in the description and, and kind of a little warning so that nobody gets accidentally spoiled on any of that stuff. But once that point comes, we are going to kind of talk openly about it. So spoilers may come up, you will be warned. But I think to kick us off, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself, how you got into writing, and maybe how you got involved with writing from Alpha? Sure. Well, um, so I grew up in the middle of nowhere, and I read a lot of books, um, and I played a lot of games. Um, and I very, like, initially I thought I was going to be just a full-time writer. Like, that was my plan. And I mean, like, in second grade plan. Uh, and then I, in college, um, started playing games more frequently. Uh, this was the height of White Wolf Game Studios just becoming a thing. Um, I'm old, so this was the 90s, early 90s. And um, I, I decided that maybe I'd be interested in doing that. A bunch of my friends, after they left college, I was, they, were, they, were in, they were seniors my freshman year. Um, after they left college, they began working for Mayfair Games, which is a local shop here in, in Chicago, uh, which no longer really exists. But on their invitation, I went to my first Gen Con in Milwaukee and uh, really just had a great time, was really impressed with you know the, the energy of, of the company, of the, the business, and thought, maybe this is what I want to do with my life. Um, and so I started trying to get freelance positions, uh, writing for various companies. Back then, you could just call a game company and say, hey, I'm interested in maybe writing for you. Uh, do you have any, any openings? Do you hire freelance writers? I had no experience at the time. I called Wizards of the Coast very early on and pitched them magic cards over the phone, um, <laughs> which is not something you can do anymore. So that did lead me to not that specific call, but um, both between interactions at Gen Con and, and these phone calls, I ended up writing for... Um, for White Wolf Game Studios back in the in the '90s, I was one of the early Wraith writers, um, and you know did some work for Mayfair. I did work for a bunch of companies that don't exist anymore, um, Atlas and and stuff. And that was sort of like the thing I was going to do with my life for a while. And then Magic: The Gathering became a thing, and it really pushed the role playing game space um, out. Uh, it's hard to hard to describe what it was like, but like I had a handshake deal with a company in Arizona that they, there was a specific game that they wanted to produce. And a friend and I were not even contracted, but offered the opportunity to pitch that game. And so we spent three or four months producing background material and mechanics and all this stuff. And we had regular scheduled calls with, calls with these guys. And they, they called me finally and were like, listen, uh, deal's off. We just licensed the Babylon 5 collectible card game, and we sold more in our first week than we've sold in five years of role-playing games. So no more role-playing games for us. And there are a bunch of games that I love that got killed at that time, Slay Industries and um, others. And it was just sort of a, a weird sea change in the industry. So I stepped back. Um, I had just gotten married and had a day job and really sort of focused on paying bills and, you know, paying off student loans and stuff for about a decade. Um, and then I came back to it and was like, this is what I want to do. Uh, 
I want to write, but instead of focusing on, on game stuff, I focused on, on novels because that had been my first love. That's what I started, you know, fifth grade through high school and into college. I thought that's what I was going to do um, and only made the switch to game stuff junior, senior year, probably. And so I started writing short stories. That's sort of how you did it back then and um, started making pro sales pretty quickly. Uh, went to my first big science fiction convention in 2003. Uh, sold my first short story the same year. Met my agent um, and a bunch of friends in the industry shortly thereafter. And I've been writing novels ever since. Um, quit my job in 2012. I was in a, worked for a company that did fundraising for primarily homeless shelters, but other nonprofits. And uh, that was a, it's a great business, but it was a miserable work because I was working like 70 hours a week and writing a book a year. And that's not good for you <laughs> um, or your relationships or anything. So um, yeah, I, I quit my job uh, after my third book came out and started working on Pig and Night, the Hollow War series. And eventually like reached some sort of level of stability. Uh, and one of the things I did to do that was I decided, first of all, that I wanted to get back into gaming like more actively. I I had been playing D and D and other games like that pretty consistently. My wife's a gamer. Um, she's been playing D and D since junior high. Uh, and in college, I had joined her her D and D group and had sort of stopped and then came back to it. Um, but I decided I wanted to get back into like tabletop gaming. Uh, and I went to a store locally in Chicago and was like, what do people play around here? And the game that they pushed forward was, was Malifaux. And so I bought the Keras box. This was, I think edition 1.5, like they had just gotten past edition one and were sort of updating everything. Mm -hmm. So I bought Keras and I played that for a while. And then that store closed. Uh, and I was sort of left without a game to play for a while. So um, I, once I was working full-time writing, I was like, I need to get back into the, both playing games and also writing for games. And I just sort of walked up to the weird booth at, at Adepticon 2016, 2017, something like that. And was like, listen, I've, I've got this background. Here's my CV. Uh, do you ever hire uh, freelance writers? The exact same thing I've been doing in college, just not over the phone, just face-to-face. And uh, I that that got me my first couple of positions, uh, first couple of contracts with Weird. Um, and then when third edition rolled around, they they really dumped a lot of stuff in my lap, and I I was I answered the call and and have been pretty consistent with them ever since. So very cool. That's that's uh, probably too long of a dialogue. But... No, that's very interesting. I, I a lot of ups and downs, unfortunately, in this industry where you know lots of companies going under and and bad things happening, but I'm glad that you stuck with it and are here now. So you you originally got introduced to the game just kind of by random chance that that store happened to be into it at the time. Was there, when you first decided to go ask them about writing for Malifaux, had you already really gotten into the lore? And was there something in particular about the lore that really made you interested in writing for it? Or was it just a kind of, you played the game, so it made sense? Yeah, no, I think... You would have to have read some of my earlier stuff, the Veridon books, but there's a lot of overlap between the kind of things I like to write and the world of Malifaux. I write a lot of kind of weird, dark stuff, and I actually, like, I think I might have sent a book to them. I can't remember. But, um, yeah, there's it's just the kind of thing that I like to do. Like, there are writers who want to write Tolkien-esque stuff, and I write a lot of fantasy. My agent is the same guy. Who represents Brandon Sanderson, and there's overlap in the kind of stuff that I that I do, um, but I I trend darker, um, and Malifaux trends darker than most games. So yeah, that's sort of I think what attracted me to the setting when I went to play it. It's what attracted me to to potentially writing it. They're the only company that I pitched at at that Adepticon, um, except for War Machine and Hordes, which is the game that I was actually playing like competitively at that time. Uh, and has since collapsed, but yeah, it's it's there's just a lot of synergies in what I do and what they what they find interesting. So, which I think is why you know 
like like if you're writing in a, in a setting that you don't love, that really comes through in the writing. If you're just kind of like trying to figure it out, uh, trying to you know make a buck. Um, but if you're passionate about that kind of uh, setting and world, then you're really gonna you're gonna do pretty well. Ironically, I'm not terribly good at the lore of Malifaux. Like every time they give me an assignment, I got to spend about a month researching the background just to make sure that I understand all the all the interactions. And then I've got voice right and stuff. Um, and in a lot of cases, you may not be aware of this, but there's some inconsistencies in the background. <laughs> that, I'm quite aware. You know, I assure you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and and. And sort of trying to resolve those. Like there have been points when I'm writing something, I'm like, you know, in this thing it says this, and over here it says this. Which one is it? And they're like, Meh. figure it out. Fix so, it. <laughs> yeah, fix it or just ignore it and kind of like roll forward and see how it goes. So, when they when they reach out to you and they tell you that they want you to write a new story for an upcoming book, what does that process look like? Like how much do they guide you in terms of what they want you to write about? Do they, do they kind of give you just like the overall structure or the, or the topic or how specific does it get with that? And how much freedom do you have? It depends on the, on the specific task. Like they hired me to write a bunch of vignettes for the other side pretty early on. And they were very loose. They just were like, we'd like to involve, you know, the following factions and however you want to like, and, and maybe some of the following events. And however you want to like form that is up to you. When I did the writing that appears in the other side rule book, they gave me almost nothing. Uh, seriously, that was just, here's some pictures of what the models are going to look like. Here's some vibes about what we kind of wanted to, to feel like go. Um, and that was very satisfying because that like world building is a thing that I really um, do well and really enjoy doing. So like a lot of what the gibbering hordes are uh, comes out of my own mad sort of, yeah, this is what it needs to look like kind of thing. And all I had was just pictures. Um, so I was very happy with how that, that all came out. Um, short stories, they'll give me a little bit longer of a persist where they want, you know, here's what we want the story to be about. Here's the characters we want to be involved. Uh, and here's generally how we want it to go. Maybe like a page long, maybe a little longer. And then I'll kind of, and here's how long it needs to be. Um, and I'll kind of build out from that. Um, something when you're doing like Ashes, uh, that's a 40,000 word document. That's half a book, uh, half of a regular novel usually, or a third, depending on what kind of novel you're writing. Um, they're much more precise. They give, they gave me a full outline, scene by scene breakdown. Uh, and when you're hiring a guy like Tim Akers, what you're hiring is a storyteller. You're hiring someone who understands how story structure is supposed to go and how character development is supposed to go. And that's not necessarily what weird the corporation is interested in or is best at. And so usually I'll, I'll have to push back and say, well, you're lacking character motivation here or the way that this is structured doesn't really match what a story structure needs to be like or whatever. So there'll be several rounds of back and forth on the outline. Like, like when they gave me the outline for Ashes, I, I had an initial pushback of, I, I, you know, here's what I think is not working about this. Uh, and here's broadly how I think it, it could be fixed. And then they'll provide feedback on that. And then I provided a much longer outline back, a uh, scene by scene breakdown. And they, they gave sort of feedback on that and then I began to produce the story and a problem with an outline like that you don't know how long each of those scenes is going to be um, and sometimes scenes get just too big especially when I'm writing them because I get hung up on I'm a big um, show don't tell kind of guy uh, and so there's a lot of dialogue a lot of action a lot of interaction of characters uh, in my work and sometimes they want to cut that and just say, have them just say what's going to happen. Or, you know, have them think to themselves, oh, this is why this is happening. And I don't like that, like as an artist, but um, that's, that's part of the job. Um, so then I'll produce the final thing, and then I'll go through two rounds of edits. Um, Kyle and Nathan will each independently react and send me back a manuscript with their comments on it. And then I'll consolidate that, do revisions, 
Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a long process for something, that, especially this long and this substantial. Like we're ending, we're ending the Burning Man. Spoilers. That's this, not a this, this, they said that this is the end of the trilogy, right? Yeah. This is the end of a trilogy. Um, yeah. Even though all three books together, the fiction barely equals a single novel. So it's kind of a quick paced trilogy and there's a lot more characters than an actual book would have. So um, it's, it's tricky, but yeah, there's, there's back and forth. I, I've, I've seen interviews of yours with, with other writers where it's basically, there's just, they're publishing fan fiction. Well, that's no longer the case. Yeah. Like they have very strong control over that was their IP is going to look like 15 years yeah. ago. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, things have changed. Yeah, for sure. That, that makes sense. I mean, there's also just a lot more lore there, so they have to, be a little bit more heavy handed, I'm sure, just to make sure everything's consistent. Makes kind of makes sense and kind of is consistent. Yeah. yeah. And plus, I mean, they're planning things that I'm not aware of. Sure. Um, so uh especially when working on like the third edition stuff, all the third edition pieces were still in playtesting. Hmm. Uh and so I was having to create stories based on character mechanics and play and, and piece mechanics. That no longer existed, and so a lot of times I'd get something back and be like, "She, she, she no longer does this. You, know? <laughs> you have to change that um, kind of thing." So, uh, yeah, it's it's tricky because when you're when you're writing for a game, there's this balance between, you know, the game mechanics being present. We're not writing game lit. We're not writing lit RPG. We're writing stories that are set in a game world, and so there are times when you know, you, you want to have the game mechanics there, but not have them poking through the story like bones or something. You really want them to be buried, but still consistent. Uh, and like trying to figure out how to visualize that stuff. Like one of the first stories I wrote was um, was Raymond, and he had this mechanic, still has this mechanic. Well, I mean, he's gone now, but um, where every time, what was it, a construct died, he would heal. Ramos, you mean? Oh, Ramos, I'm sorry, yeah. yeah. Um, um, I barely played him in second edition, so I don't remember what the mechanic. Yeah, there. I think there's something where, like, and again, the comments are going to go nuts about this, but if I remember correctly, there was something where, like, every time a construct died within a certain distance of him, he would heal. And how do you visualize that in a story? Like, how does that? I just left it out at, at the end. I'm just like, <laughs> and you know, people made comments on it. People were like, "Well, why didn't he heal then?" I'm like. Because that looks dumb. That's why. Like, I don't know what you do. It blows up and it just the metal slaps against his skin and it stops bleeding. No, that doesn't make sense. You're right. But yeah, interesting. I'm su- I'm surprised people nitpicked that hard. But I guess I'm not surprised that people nitpick that hard. I shouldn't say that because of course um, among writers, there's kind of, especially fantasy writers and science fiction writers. There's this this joke about there are two groups of people that you don't want to annoy and you have to do your research on. Otherwise, you're going to hear about it. And it's gun people and horse people. Uh, and they really care about how guns and horses work. I'm like, I don't, I don't care. Like I'm a swords guy. Um, guns exist in the worlds that I write, but I'm not, you know, going on and on about the clock nine or, or you know, however you want to, however you want to define it. Yeah. Um, but they'll say something every time horses too. And don't mess with the grenadiers because they're horse and gun people. Oh God. It's the, it's the worst of both worlds. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you sort of touched on this a little bit, but, um, I've noticed that, especially coming into third edition, you handled a lot of the really important stories for some of the older characters that have been in the lore for a really long time, um, and stories that really change them in, in a lot of significant ways. So what are the challenges with writing for a character who might already have five, six, seven short stories about them and have had their own story arcs in some cases? And do you think there's actually any, I'm sure there's some constraints there, but do you think there's actually any benefits to writing for a character like that? Well, I, I mean, so the benefits are the same, like when you're writing in fantasy in general, whenever you use an elf, people have expectations. If you use a dwarf, people have expectations. And they make comfortable shorthand for character types. Not as true with these characters, the the Ramoses and, and Tonys of the world, but um it still uh, it gives you backgrounds to feed off of, and it makes it easier to know what the character is going to do because you you kind of already have a blueprint in place, and if something about that is going to change, then uh, you have to really you know justify it within 
character motivation and and within what already exists about the character. That's one of the things that I ended up having to change whenever uh, Ravencroft came back. Um, all we had was this short story. That was all that existed. Um, but we had an idea of what sort of character he was. And the story that got written by someone else, that character didn't match the, the original character. They were very different people. Uh, and that's the part that I took out and just rewrote Scratch because it didn't make sense. Like what was happening didn't make sense compared to the original character. And so, you know, you're playing off something that already exists. It's a lot easier, honestly. Um, but it's also difficult because you, you can't just do whatever you want. Um, you really have to, this train is only going one way, you know, the tracks are here, uh, and you can't just jump around and do whatever you want to with it. Um, and that, that's honestly something where the folks at weird are a little more helpful or where they, like they run, they run hurt on it because, um, you know, I'll have somebody say something again. Ashes spoilers, but I'll have someone say something and they'll come back with, mm, that's not really how they would probably react in that situation. Um, you're kind of, you know, these people hate each other more than you're portraying or hate each other less, or this person is actually scared of that person. You need to, to include that. Um, some of that is in the fiction. Some of it's in the character bios. Um, some of it has just grown out of like community feedback. Uh, and you know observations that have come from from the larger weird fan base, uh, where it's like you know these characters wouldn't wouldn't function that way for the following reasons, and weird notices that and is like yeah you know you're right that makes sense, um, and then that gets fed into me and then it shows up in the fiction. So um, yeah, it's again like with anything, it is both more constraining but also it, you, it teaches you something about how character works, and as long as and it's not always true, but as long as it's been consistent in the past, it makes it easier to create the character. Yeah, very interesting. I think throughout all of your work that I've read, I've, I've, I think I've read, I'm, I'm halfway through, um, what is the name of your newest novel? I don't know why I'm so terrible. Wraithbound? Wraithbound. I'm, I'm atrocious at remembering names for some reason. Yeah, so I'm halfway through Wraithbound, I read, and, and I've read a, a bunch of your other stuff, a couple of the novellas and some of the earlier novels I'm kind of working my way through, but one thing that I've noticed, and you sort of touched on it as well, is that um, a big focus of a lot of your writing is the sort of character development, which is obviously a very important part of any story. But in the past with Malifaux, I don't know if it's because a lot of the characters are absent from the lore for a long period of time because there's so many characters, or if it's because um, there's different writers handling them at different times. Some of the characters tend to be very static. They tend to not really have much development over the course of 10 years in the writing. Almost all of the stories that you've written, the characters did have a significant amount of development, even in a short, you know, 10, 15 page story, whatever it might be. Is that part of the pitch that you're given or the outline that you're given from Weird? Are they asking you to develop those characters in these ways? Or is that something that you're bringing to the sort of plot that they want you to develop and you're kind of bringing the character development yourself? Uh, I think, hmm, that's a good question. I, I think I'm bringing the development myself, but they give me, you know, here are the things that need to happen. And when that comes up, my first question is always, well, why? <laughs> you know, what is the reason that that Tony's making this deal? What is the reason that, you know, Karis and Tony are having these issues? What's what's the background behind that? And so I always take like whatever the events are, and then I take a step back and try to figure out what exactly is going to lead to that point? Short stories are actually kind of difficult for me as a writer because I think in novel-sized ideas. And so um, my, my approach to any story is always how far back can I get and figure out what the root causes are and then work my way forward. And at what point do I actually start writing these things down? Where does the story actually begin? Um, and sometimes that's farther back than weird once and they cut stuff, um, or there's stuff that I end up writing that I'm really just writing for myself to get an idea, to get a feel for the character, to get a feel for the situation. Uh, and then I'll cut that stuff and then 
cut to the chase or cut to the, it's called the red line in, among writing circles. When, whenever you're in a writing group and someone hands you a thing, one of the first questions you ask is where would the story actually begin? Where should it actually begin? And you'll, you'll read and read and read and read. And then you'll drop a line and say, this is where your story actually starts. Um, anyway, so I, that, that process of going back and moving forward uh, is, is my approach to all, all things that I write. And so I think organically that character development is occurring because big events are happening in the story. Uh, and those big events have to have a cause and they have to have an impact. Um, if you have a, like there's, there are static characters in the world, Superman, for example, but it's not very interesting. Um, I'm much bigger into where they started, what happens, and then what, what their reaction to that is. I think that's why people care about characters. They like what the character is, but they really want to see what the character becomes. Uh, characters like Harry Dresden, um, Paul Atreides, these are all characters that, that really resonate with people, but not because they're the same all the time. They, they change and develop, and we see our own change and develop with them. So, um, or through them. So, yeah, I think, you know, I think that's, that's part of my skill as a writer. And part of what makes, makes it interesting for me is, is coming up with how these things change and why. It sounds like what you're saying is we need a Malifaux novel. I don't know how much I want to say about that. Um, I will tell you that there is a push within Weird to do that kind of thing. Um, and, I, it, it's challenging because if you want to try to, this is going to get into baseball, but if you want to try to like follow traditional um, distribution models, uh, you need a much larger fan base than, than Weird has to produce a novel and make it profitable. Um, Games Workshop can do it because of, I mean, Black Library is huge, um, but that requires a certain number of expected sales. I mean, they could do it. Uh, and it might be a money losing operation, or they may make enough to to cover, or they may um, they may make some money on it, depending on how they how they produce the actual document. A lot of their stuff is direct sale already, um, and so they're you know they're cutting out a middleman or two there yeah. to their advantage. Um, but there has been talk about novels in the past. the The challenge that they have. It's like, where, where would you start? How many masters are there? Like 60? 60 I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's an enormous number. Yeah. So who, whoever you pick, um, you know, you're going to anger 98% of your audience. Well, uh, I always thought that if they were going to do a novel, they, should, they would start with an original character because that avoids that problem. But I'm not a writer, so I don't know what the pros and cons of that might be. From that. I mean, there are pros and cons to it, but it also means that you would then Boy, 100% of your fan base because everybody who who plays this game has one or two characters that they really resonate with yeah. um, and you know for me it's Sandeep uh, I know for you it's Tony um, and unless you know everyone's got somebody uh, and so they're, they're really going to struggle to like get people to make people happy yeah. uh, and when you start like maybe you make an original character and have them be kind of outside of the guild arcanist structure and not have them be a playable character. Maybe you, you do and you have your first anybody, you know, uh, master. But, you know, you, you got to sell them on the character. Uh, and that, that gets tricky. Even saying you do a new character. Okay, so, like, who is it? What, who do they belong to? Uh, and then you're still cutting off portions of factions, you know. Or multiple POVs. I mean, there there are ways to do it, but uh, it would be it would be challenging. Uh, it, it may happen someday. I don't know. I can tell you, I probably will not be the guy writing it because I'm already committed to writing two books this year, um, plus three novellas, and that's a lot of time. Um, so, but they have they have people that can do these things. Well, hopefully if they do it, it does well, and then we get more, and you'll get to do one after that. So, <laughs> Well, that's the trick. Like, anytime you write a book or, or start a new series, um, you have people who are like, well, I'm not going to pick it up until the series ends. It's a guaranteed way to get the series canceled because, yeah, uh, yeah people are not going to, the publisher can't, 
keep turning out books in a series that isn't selling. And every book that you put out in a series after the first one sells right. less. Yeah. Because you have fewer readers. Like you're limited. So it's yeah, it's tricky. Yeah, well, I still got my fingers crossed. I'm looking forward to it. I, I'm, I'm hopeful for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another thing that I've picked up, both in your reading your work as well as uh, some of the conversations that we've had off air, is that you tend to, you know, Malfo has a lot of different sort of cultures and different perspectives and different types of people in it, which is honestly one of the major things that attracted me to the game to begin with. But you have a couple of like little nods to different things. Like you just mentioned that you really like Sandeep. So in one of the stories you wrote about him, there's like a little reference to a, a type of tea that he drinks from India that he brought over from Earthside. And I remember you mentioning a while back that when you were writing for Beyond the Other Side, you did a whole bunch of research about like the politics of South Asia and, and the Pacific and, and stuff like that. How important do you think that those things are to incorporate into your writing? And why do you think they're important? Uh, in my opinion, super important. Um, and I should say, like, my first writing, my first paying gig for White Wolf was uh, create the world of the dead of the Mesoamericans. And I'm a white dude from the Midwest, you know. <laughs> so I, I want to do that in uh, a respectful and caring way. But also I want to, like, have fun with it. Um, and there's this kind of balance between don't offend anybody, but also write something that people want to read. And yeah, so I think it's it's super important. And I think that the broader you read historically and in, in, in nonfiction, the more realism that you'll bring to to the work that you're you're on, while also learning something about the world. You know, which is that's good. <laughs> um, uh, that that makes you a better person. That creates empathy. That that lets you know something other than what what's good at Culver's tonight. So um, I, yeah, I think that's super valuable. And I think it's a great, it is an, an endless resource of just fascinating stuff. I mentioned um, when I quit my job, I wrote uh, a series called The Hallowed War. And it's kind of a hard book to describe to people because it's um, it's a combination of like Shintoism, and Mesoamerican duology, but filtered through the integration of paganism into the Catholic Church uh, during the Middle Ages, but also a sword fight. You know, it's 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 an adventure story that happens in a world that is influenced by all of those things. And so, uh, you know, when you read a Tim Akers book, you are going to experience, whether you know it or not, like 12 different cultures. And it's all going to be filtered through the weird little noodle inside my brain. Um, and it's, you know, I think that, that there's so much material out there that's just fascinating and, and really, uh, in, in depth that you can, you can get a lot of value out of. And people think that you're being really creative. All you are is familiar with, you know, 12th century Irish politics. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I, I, I encourage it. And I think that writers, especially when they go into fantasy and science fiction, fantasy in, in specific are kind of lazy. Um, I get really frustrated with the way that religion is handled in most fantasy novels because they're, they're, you know, they're just working out their own problems with church, which is fine. I get it. I got my own problems with church, but at the same time, like there's, you know, you, there's a lot you can involve with, with a religion and, and with, you know, the supernatural and, and, and politics and, and sexual identity. There's all, there's so much variety available, but why are you? just repeating what Tolkien already did. I, I don't, I don't get it. But. Yeah. I mean, even just digging into things like Mesoamerican legends is, is one of those things that like very few people are touching on those things. And there's all these interesting stories in this interesting culture, but we just get Norse mythology fed to us over and over. Yeah. And it's like, I like Norse mythology cool. just fine. Sure. I like Ravens. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> you really need to learn more about the Mesoamericans. And I, I sort of like, um, uh, I mean, with Sandeep Indian stuff, uh, in subcontinent and there's again it's just the way that that various mythologies traveled through that area and and developed and kind of bumped against each other and took influence and moved to japan and then came back and it's just oh it's so great yeah. so great stuff for sure so another kind of through line that i've noticed between again kind of 
both your Malfoy writing as well as your non-Malfoy writing, is that you do these really well put together kind of duels between two characters where they're kind of having some sort of conversation while they're in the middle of a fight. And I feel like those scenes are really tricky to do because you can kind of lean into this trope of like the villain explains his evil plot to the to the protagonist and it's like a little bit corny. Um, and there's also some pacing issues where I've I've read similar scenes where it either leans too far on the combat side where it's just a fight scene and it kind of ends up boring or they're just talking too much. What do you, why do you think scenes like that are interesting for kind of laying out the plot and and how do you think or or what do you think the secrets are to kind of writing a good one that's that feels well balanced and realistic? I could talk for three hours about that. Um, <laughs> so two things. Um, first of all. Writing is a bunch of skills. People are like, this person's a good writer, that person's a good writer, this person's a bad writer. Usually none of those people are actually good or bad writers. They've, they're usually good or bad at one or two elements. And those are the elements that you as a reader most either are off put by or are most interested in. So there are a lot of skills in writing. And I am a person who is very serious about the craft of writing and about figuring out what I'm not good at and working on it. So when I first started getting published, my agent was like, here are your weaknesses. Uh, here are the things that I think you need to work on. And that was plotting and pacing, uh, fight scenes, and dialogue. And so I've spent, and I'm not joking, like 20 years figuring out how to do that as well as I can. And that has mostly been a matter of practice reading good books, reading books that do these things well, and really thinking about and taking notes, you know, outlining uh, why this scene works, why this book works, and so forth. Whenever I finish a book that I really enjoy, the first thing I do is I outline the whole thing, um, you know, chapter by chapter, analyzing scenes, trying to decide why did that scene work? Why didn't it work? Um, what ways could it have been improved? How could it have been changed? Um, but I, as far as like fight scenes and, and dialogue are concerned, and using that to move forward the plot, um, that's part of my show don't tell mentality. Uh, I really want everything from character uh, development to plot um, progress to world building as much as possible to come through via interaction, to be revealed to the reader through some sort of active thing, demonstrating the magic system, demonstrating the character's opinions, um, you know, uh, just trying to improve things in a way that really keep the character, keep the reader interested so that they're learning things without really realizing that they're learning things. Um, you know, the specifics of, of fight scenes, uh, this bookshelf behind me, there are many manuals on combat. Um, and learning how to do blocking uh, and making a scene concrete enough that the reader understands what's going on without being confused, without overworking the details, that just takes practice. Um, that just takes time and having um, beta readers and critiquers who are willing to be honest with you and not worry about hurting your feelings. As a writer, it's, you know, getting to the point where your ego just doesn't exist anymore. It's a weird balance because you have to be like, you have to be egotistical enough to be like, well, anybody wants to read what I've got to say. Clearly, I've got all these brilliant ideas. But also when somebody critiques something that you do, you have to be comfortable enough in yourself and humble enough to be like, well, you may be right, you know, or to not take a wound from it because it's very easy. I mean, it's a very personal thing writing, you know, it's very, um, internal almost because you're just you and the computer or you and whatever device that you're using uh and then you put it out in the world and people you know um they defecate all over it kind of publicly and you have to get comfortable with with uh seeing that and not not being hurt by it but also trying to take criticism and learning how to how to develop that and, and how do you develop that into your own work um but also sometimes people will give you criticism and it's just a matter of like, well, you don't like the kind of things I like, you know? So that's okay. You're allowed to not like it. That's not, that's not my problem after a certain point. 
Yeah, I, I don't think I answered the question, but I I did run around it for a while. I think, I, that. I think that's that's fair enough. Yeah, I mean, um, I think I think your answer was practice. You gotta you gotta you gotta write. You gotta keep trying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, read, thing figure and, out where, figure out things that it works for, and then figure out why. Think about it. You know, outline, practice, work harder. My my favorite of the duels that I've written read of yours is the Tony Karras duel. I think. I don't like to pick a favorite story from Alpha, but if if when people ask me that, it's it's always part of the answer is uh, a line drone and fire. I love that story a lot. Um, I could have sat here with you for well over an hour and just talked about Tony Ironsides as a character because <laughs> if anybody hasn't referenced the description yet, um, you are responsible for. After the first story where she was introduced, you've been responsible for the kind of major. Uh, stories that featured her, and your, and those are the reason why she's my favorite character. Um, but with I annoy people on my Discord enough by constantly talking about her, so I'm going to limit it to one question about Tony Ironside. Okay. And it's going to be a surprise for a lot of people. So, in the story where she makes the deal and sells out Ramos, she's she's obviously very conflicted about making that decision, and she and she decides to go ahead and do it for the sake of sort of suffrage for or or pushing for suffrage in the United States. It's not until later that we get the conversation with her and Karis where she explains to Karis that she did it because Ramos had been uh, sort of squandering the Union's resources and he'd been off on this quest up in the mountains to try try to find the Solson geode and that that was actually a bad thing. It was hurting their kind of effort. How much of that was Tony justifying what she did to herself after the fact? And how much of that was the actual reason why she made the deal that she made? I, I think largely the former. I think um, whenever we make a difficult decision like that, uh, whatever that decision is, we always, after the fact, try to figure out why we did it. We know why, you know, at the moment. Um, but uh, there's all, whenever we f- get feedback or, or trouble from other people about it, um, we're going to try to justify it. And in my mind, Tony is not coming up with a reason that she did why, why she did what she did, but she's coming up with a reason that Karis would understand that she would, why she would do it. Because at that stage, the question is, is Karis's, and this is just my opinion, is Karis's loyalty to the union or was it to Ramos as a person and extricating those things is kind of up in the air. Um, I don't think I've touched Karis since then. And I don't know. I'll just say, I don't think the character went in the direction that I would want her to go. Um, she was my first master and I, I have a lot of feelings about her. Um, I don't, uh, I'll say, I don't love the way that, that things have gone since then. Um, but that's you know, it's the nature of the game. It's part of of we're doing work for higher stuff. So that that's my my answer to that is that Tony is is justifying in her mind, but not justifying in her mind to herself. She knows her answer. Um, she's justifying. She's finding a reason that other people would find it acceptable because um, they're never going to care about that as much as she is. Um, yeah, that right. makes sense. Yeah. No. Absolutely. People are going to be shocked that I asked a question that was made her maybe look bad because I'm, I'm usually just <laughs> fanboying out about her. So <laughs> I wanted to be fair about it. <laughs> uh, uh. Um, just to touch on a couple of other uh, uh, of the specific stories that you've written. You, you also wrote the story where Hoffman gets recruited into the Arcanist. Do you think that Hoffman ha- will have any long-term loyalty to the MNSU? He's always been a weird fit for the guild, but he does seem like he's sort of drank the Kool-Aid to an extent where he believes that the guild is doing the right thing, at least some part of the way. Do you think that there's a reason for him to stay after they resolve this issue with the sort of amalgamations that are hidden by Ramos? I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I struggle with that because you're right. Like, what's his reason for um, for doing the things that he does. And I don't think his goals and the union's goals necessarily align. I think Hoffman 
I think a lot of people in the game are in kind of a weird place where none of them are true believers in whatever it is that they have uh, been presented with faction-wise. That's just the faction that most closely represents their needs. Um, and you're right that, you know, he's always been an odd fit for the guild. I think he's an odd fit for the Arcanist, too. So, I don't know. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's always seemed like just thematically because of what he does, it fit, he fit with the union and also we needed a replacement for Ramos mechanically. Yeah. But, and I, and I really liked that story and I thought it was an interesting way because originally if you just said there's going to be a guild Arcanist master, it's like, that does not make any sense. Why would that be a thing? I think that was a really interesting way to bridge that gap. But again, I don't know if uh, long term that's a sustainable relationship. Can you name for me a single stable relationship in Malifo? No, that's like, a fair point. Yeah, <laughs> everyone is acting for different reasons. Uh, it's just a question of who they will who they will screw over next. So yeah, I mean that's part of the reason why it's interesting, right? Yeah. Um, you also did some of the writing, or you wrote uh, in Madness of Malifo with the new masters come into the game. Did you have a favorite of the new six masters, or I guess five because one didn't really show up in that story? Dude, that was years ago. Um, <laughs> which so which masters are we talking about? Damien, Lindley, Castor, Clampets, Tiri. Yeah, I, I hate to admit that I'm not really a Gremlins guy. Um, Damien's cool. Like I understand Damien's background and stuff. That was the last one. Um, who was it? Tull is the last one. I oh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, Damien's cool. I, I, I like Castor. I've actually started playing Neverborn recently. Um, I think this sort of ancient evils kind of thing uh, is fun. Uh, and I really, yeah, I really struggle with um, what Castor's going to end up doing as far as, like, I don't know, I'm getting spoiler stuff, but, uh, like, where he's going to end up in the in the the current power structure structure struggle, uh, struggle among uh, the Neverborn, but I, I like that kind of um, sort of dark background kind of guy. But Damien's just cool too. Um, just he's sort of John Wick meets Harry Dresden kind of guy, and that's how do you not like that? Yeah. <laughs> so this was actually going to be my next question anyway. This is probably like the fourth time that you've. Uh, you've mentioned something that I was just about to ask about, which I guess is a good sign because it means we're on the same page. Um, the gremlins really don't get featured a lot in the story, in the sort of important, you know, the the overall plot or even the B plots in most cases. Do you think that there's potential there that has at least so far been untapped for some good stories from the gremlins? Or do you think they're kind of comic relief and they should stay that way? Well, so I think. They've been treated as comic relief up to this point. And uh, um, <clears throat> I think that that reflects weird sensibilities. That reflects the place that they've been put in. That's like what they're supposed to do. You know, they're supposed to be the funny ha-ha thing. Um, and there are people who love that. Um, I, I don't. Uh, and that's fine. I grew up in the South. And uh, I know those guys. Um, and so it, you know it's always felt slightly racist to me quite, um or at least culturist uh but at the same time like you know there there's definitely there's a whole part of the world that we're not even really looking at so um i will tell you every time that there is a scene in something that i've been assigned that includes the gremlins uh the notes are something along the lines of and then gremlins do gremlin stuff and figuring out a way to make that interesting and advancing the plot is always is always a struggle and so it just kind of winnows away um yeah i i don't think that's an intentional decision on on weird's part but i think there's a lot of space there that just hasn't been explored so cool yeah so i think at this point um i'll ask you a couple of kind of wrap-up questions for the people who are uh, not doesn't don't want to hear any of the ashes spoilers, and then we can kind of jump into the ashes stuff if that works. Sure. Um, what do you have coming up of your own that people can look forward to if they're 
Um, so the mass market of Wraithbound just came out uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, that's the first book in a new series. I need it to do well because then the publisher will actually buy the next book of the 20 that I have planned for that world. Um, <laughs> that's kind of like Wraithbound is sort of the the world in the series that I want to spend my rest of my life writing. So, but in order for that to happen, you know, obviously they have to sell. Um, I have a series called Nightwatch, which is a lot different than everything else that I do. Uh, it is very light and funny. Um, it's a portal fantasy. It's library journal called it a mix of um, uh, Terry Pratchett meets Jim Butcher. Uh, and the third book in that series comes out next month. So um, yeah, those are the things that are currently in my, in my feed. Uh, I have the Bladecaster novellas that I'm very fond of, um, Servant of the Pale Sword and Prophet of a Blind God. Those are kind of old school sword and sorcery, uh, Jason Bourne meets the Witcher kind of stuff. Um, and I, I love those too. So those are the things that are currently on my plate. Yes, yeah, so I, re I read both the novellas and I think those are great, especially if people prefer kind of short form stuff because they're very digestible. Um, but, and I, I think I mentioned before, I'm right in the middle of Wraithbound and there it's, I would be sitting here reading that all morning if I wasn't preparing <laughs> for this interview, because it's kind of, it's, it, I'm at a point right now where stuff is really popping off and it's got me, uh, on the edge of my seat. So I definitely recommend people check that out. It's an interesting book because like I said, Brandon Sanderson's a, a client of mine and, or not a client of mine, a, he's, we're at the same agency. Mm -hmm. Um, but that book has been described as Brandon Sanderson without the bloat or Sanderson at a thriller pace. Like that was a very intentional decision. I was like, you know, I, I, I want this to be a fast read and exciting read uh, and not 20 pages about trees or, you know, the nature of the world or anything. So it's, it's a high action, hard magic kind of game. So it's fun. Very cool. My favorite question to ask people who write for weird. If you could write, the next chapter for any one character in the game, who would it be? So, and this loops back to our earlier conversation. I want to know what happens to Karis. Uh, and I kind of want to have a little bit of control of that. So that's, that's my answer. Um, with the understanding that I haven't been happy with the way <laughs> things have gone for like three books. Now. Um, so yeah, that's that's my answer. Very cool. And where can folks keep up with you and and what you do? Tim Akers. I'm the only semi-famous living Tim Akers on the internet. Um, so just Google my name, and you'll find my website, my Twitter feed, my Facebook page. I have a newsletter. Um, all of these things occasionally get my attention when I'm not writing, which is most of the time. Very cool. Awesome. All right, so anybody who doesn't want to be spoiled on Ashes can close out the video for now. Come back when you're, when you're done reading. Um, go finish it. It's very good. So I guess to just kind of get into it a little bit here, you, you talked about having kind of like an outline or a broad view of the stories when they present them to you. And obviously this is, I think, I think it's the longest Malfoy story so far. I didn't actually check that. I should have checked that before I started this. But it's, it's very close if it's not the longest. They're the same size as, as Madness. It's okay. about 40,000 words. Okay. Um, what was the overall pitch here? Like, what, what did they kind of present you with? Because there's obviously a lot of kind of moving parts and things happening. Um, so the initial outline didn't have a lot of character agency. I'll just say that. Um, it was just a series of events uh, that culminated in... Um, the engine going off and destroying or tearing apart the Burning Man. And it, it honestly was just people gathering parts and they didn't know why they were doing it. And uh, in some cases, things were happening by accident or, um, you know, because the fates had decided and so, so, and so would fall into the machine. Uh, and I, I really didn't like that because again, like I'm a character agency guy, I'm a, I care about character development and I want people to have a reason for doing things. So I pitched back this idea of, well, what if we have kind of two teams, uh, one of them working for obliteration and one of them working for witness. 
And here are the people who will be on this team. And here are the people who will be on this team. And they both have reasons for doing what they're doing. But they're sometimes working at cross purposes, sometimes working toward the same end goal. Um, and it will, it will end pretty much the same way. It's just the people will be there for a reason. Like the, in the original outline, everyone was in that room with the machine trying to make it work, but none of them knew why. And none of them knew what it was going to do. Uh, and so I, as I've mentioned, like I produced this manuscript and gave it to them. And then they, they went back and changed a bunch of stuff. And they kind of strayed back toward that. We don't know why this is working. We don't know what it does um, thing. And like, especially that last scene where after Damien shows up uh, in my I don't know how much I want to say about this, but in my manuscript, he was there to stop them. Um, and they started the machine uh, kind of after or before he got there. And then he's like, well, then we need to redirect it. We need to try to essentially ride this out in a way that keeps it from destroying everything. Because, I mean, who made it? Obliteration. What is obliteration's purpose? It's in the name. You know, he's, you he's <laughs> right. He's there to return everything to its primal zero. He's he's the ultimate anarchist. You know, go into the woods, forget language, obliteration. Um, and it sort of strayed from that. Like as the book exists, the implication is that obliteration specifically built the machine to handle Sharuf, to handle the Burning Man, and that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, still now, like, I still think they kind of edited out a lot of the witnesses trying to stop this from happening because she's the one who put him in jail in the first place. Um, and obliteration is trying to do this other thing and they meet somewhere in the middle. Uh, and people like Gretchen and the, uh, um, Thierry and stuff, they end up directing it toward, um, the burning man. With the, I mean, Gretchen is there because she thinks the machine might be able to handle the the Burning Man, and Damien knows that it can't. Uh, and it's, there's this this redirection that is supposed to occur, uh, and they just they cut all that out. So um, at the end, like I just finished reading it a little while ago because I was just going through with my man and the thing, and sort of comparing individual scenes and trying to sift through why they had made the changes that they made. Some of them make perfect sense. Some of them, like, there are things that uh, I I didn't have access to as far as, like, the development of the world goes that they added in, kind of, I think, last second. Um, The Kara scene, the Castor scene, none of those are mine. Um, But, you know, at the same time, uh, I kind of feel like there were things about that initial outline that I'm like, this isn't going to work. Uh, this is not how a story is shaped. This is not how you want characters to develop. But they trended back toward them for their own reasons. And I mean, you know, they've got a bigger picture of things than I do. I'm only interested in making a satisfactory story. Um, and they had maybe a broader plan. Uh, yeah, so. I think whatever. the idea there, at least my interpretation, was that the burning man's sort of like traveling back through time, changing things sent the, I think it was the watch from Mm -hmm. Kitchener to obliteration in the ancient past. And I think maybe the idea was that he found out this was going to happen in the future. And that's why he made the machine. I always find time travel unsatisfying. So I didn't love that aspect of it, but I think that's what they were going for. Yeah. And the, the watch was there from the beginning. Um, And they never really defined how he got a watch or why he had it, um, or what he planned to do with it. So, I mean, that might have been their plan. I'm not entirely sure. There are tomes of knowledge that I don't have access to in Weird Headquarters in Marietta, Georgia. Uh, So that could be it. I don't know. It's it's hard to say. Kind of going back to a a couple of things that we've touched on before, but throughout all of the lore over the years, there's sort of... It, it's sort of oscillated back and forth between a focus on the bigger picture, like a big A plot kind of grand narrative and more of a focus on characters and like everyone's individual story. And 
it seems like this was this kind of three book series here was supposed to be more of a focus on the big arc as opposed to the smaller stories. One of the things that I really liked about this book compared to the last two was that there was more characters and we got a lot more of their individual stories and developing of the individual characters. How much is that something that you have to think about? Because again, this is kind of unusual in the sense that it was a three, a three book trilogy. How much is that of that? Did you have to think about while you were writing this in terms of, you know, whether to focus on a handful of characters stories or the big plot or, and, and kind of balancing those two? Um, I, I wasn't given a choice in that. Like they very specifically said here, are the scene participating in those scenes. Um, and here's what we need them to do. So, uh, I honestly think there's there's too many characters in this to tell any one character art satisfactorily, um, but that's a problem with with Malifaux in general, where you've got so many characters across such a large geographical area with so many different plans going on, uh, and you're just kind of trying to to keep a plot going in the middle of all of that. It's it can be really challenging, you know. Uh, that's not how you want to structure like a, a piece this long, 40,000 words. That's two character stops for me. Um, otherwise you're just kind of touching on everybody a little bit and, and that's, that's the end of it. Um, I would have preferred, you know, just a very limited kind of focus. Uh, I like the old system back when each faction got three stories, not where, uh, all factions get one story. Uh, it's it's challenging, but um, that's the direction that they've decided to go, and I, I understand why. There's a lot fewer pages involved with this, uh, and it also advances kind of the big meta plot stuff a little a little better, a little easier than these scattered things. And it's harder to get into the lore of Malifaux um, if you don't uh, if you if you need to read 15 books to know what's actually going on. Uh, than it is, you know, here's the three book set, it's 120,000 words, go for it. Um, that, that's a little easier to at least get an idea of what's going on. So I get it. Yeah, I think I'm with you that I preferred the the separate stories where we got, you know, a story about one or two characters and uh, and we got a bunch of those types of stories. But I think that's a really good point that, I, I and I've had, I've, I've chatted with a handful of people in the last couple of weeks of like, that are just getting to Lauren, they're like, where do I start? And it's actually kind of nice to be able to just say, <laughs> Just pick up Burns, Madness, and Ashes, and that's you know that's a self-contained story. You don't yeah. really need to, you know. It, obviously, there's background knowledge that helps you, but you can dig into that at your leisure afterwards. So I think that's a good yeah. Thing. Yeah. Did you? I mean, it, it sounds like probably the answer here is no. But how much of the overall kind of structure of the three stories did you know about when you were writing the earlier books? It, was it no. very self-contained? It was just siloed off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, nothing. Didn't have, and I'm not sure they really knew where they were going, honestly. Um, I know, especially with the Burning Man, like, the the pitch for the Burning Man was, he's going to screw everything up. <laughs> you know, he's just going to throw everything in the air, and chaos is going to happen, and we'll just see how the pieces fall. And, yeah, so I don't, I, I, I didn't have any idea early on, and I'm not convinced they really had a plan going in, but they might have. Um, it just didn't feel that way uh, when I got to the end of it. Like, um, there's that prophecy at the very beginning of Ashes. And I was like, all right, uh, what is this referring to? They gave me the prophecy. Like, what is this referring to? Um, what specific and what stories can I go read so that I know what what the reference is here? Um, and uh, I, one of them was there. They were just kind of like, we're not really sure what this one means. You know, uh, just figure it out. You know, come, come up with something uh, that, that fits into that, into that space. And so it's hard to say that they really went into it with like an uh, end goal plan, which is the opposite of how you plot a novel. You come up with an overall pitch, and then you figure out what your ending is going to be, and then you work backwards. Um, so, yeah, that's... That was challenging. The good thing that that Weird does is they they keep a lot of balls in the air, mm. uh, and so it is very easy to, after the fact, go back and be like, "Oh, you know, here's a place that this 
that this thing that we threw up three books ago would fit and it will look like we're genius, you know? <laughs> and that's the same way that like, you know, that's how George Martin plots his books. That's how uh, Lost the Television Series plotted their story. Yeah. Crazy things happened. They didn't really know where they were going, but crazy things happened. And so it's very satisfying, you know, as you're going along, but it, it gets harder to land uh, the series. Um, it, it creates a difficult situation for, for whoever's job it ends up being to, to park the bus. So, Yeah, that makes sense. I've definitely noticed that even back from the beginning, there was a lot of that, like, here's some uh, things, tend, they tend to keep things kind of vague and, and indefinite where yeah. they can then kind of go back and say, oh, well, this is what that meant. And I, I guess there's a certain utility to that where they, can, they don't paint themselves into a corner. So it makes some sense. Especially since, like, you know, the person who's in charge of line development is going to change over time. The person who was in charge when I started writing is no longer in charge. You're going to get different writers who end up having different ideas about how things, you know, can work or should work or, um, you know, they develop interesting things. Like, I mean, the end of this, they just said, we kind of think the next big bad is maybe going to be this. And so they changed the last paragraph that I had written slightly um, in a way that kind of redirects it. But like I wrote my last paragraph and sent it to him and I just put in the comments, I'm like, I'm not sure what this is and I'm not sure what you're going to be able to do with it, but it seems interesting. And Kyle wrote back, was like, neither do I, but you're right. It's cool. So we're going to, we're going to see where it goes. <laughs> Let them roll. <laughs> I, was also as I was kind of going through all the stories that you wrote, I noticed that you have written about nine of the thirteen tyrants, and of those nine, seven of them you actually have written from the tyrant's perspective or the tyrant as a character, as opposed to just their sort of person mm -hmm. that they're living inside of at the at the moment. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that is a coincidence, especially considering that you mentioned before that you really like the sort of ancient evil element of stories? Or do you think they were intentionally giving you those stories because that's a thing that you're good at and you like? You would have to ask them. But I, I think that any time you're consistently giving a writer the same kind of story, it's because you recognize that it's good at. And, um, you know, you're picking them for a reason. They have a stable of writers that they could be using. Um, I've sent them friends of mine to, to write for them. Uh, so they, they've got plenty of, plenty of options available. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, I, I do old God well. According to my research, you, the four you have not written for are Nightmare, Nameless, The Dragon, and The Gorgon. Do you, if you had to pick one of those to write about, which one of them do you think you would want to? The Dragon. The Dragon. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would be fun. Any particular I think that would be solid. Like... Um... Let's see. He's the one who was stuck in the river for a while, right? Is that who I'm thinking of? He was the one who, when they were going to defeat him in the ancient past, he split himself in two. Right. And one yeah. half flew to Earth and landed in Tibet, and the other half... Or, I'm sorry, not in Tibet. Uh, somewhere in the Middle East, and then ended up in Tibet. And the yeah. other half landed in the bayou. It's, that's the history part of it. That's what fascinates me. Because yeah. there's, again, you're going to have access to all, all of Tibet and slash, you know, Middle Eastern history, which is some crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, and just being able to access that in your, in your story would be a lot of fun. So that's the main reason. Very cool. So my last question was going to be for you to, predict, for you to predict who the next big bad will be now that the Burning Man is sort of on the back burner. But it sounds like you already have some indication from weird of who that might be. So that's probably <clears> not a great question. So I'm going to change it slightly and say, if you could pick who the next big bad was going to be, who would it be? But you can't say the dragon because you're ready to use that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm actually a little tired of the tyrants. I, I want the next big problem to be people being bad to each other. You know, uh, I would like to see significant change in the power structures of Malifo city. Um, and I want to see that ripple out into the other side, or better yet, the other side being, you know, the Earth side of things. Or better yet, I would love to see some threat from the Earth side boil into Malifo and have the guild be like, well, we're in charge here. You know, we have all this magic power. 
but somehow, you know, like the, um, the Abyssians, you know, that would be, uh, an amazing kind of like, you know, no, we're in charge, uh, kind of thing. So I think, I think something like that, where you've got Earthside problems becoming Malifaux problems as opposed to the other way around. I think that would be fun. Very cool. I like that answer a lot. I would like to see there's, there's, there's been hints about the power structure in Malifaux changing for a very, very long time. And it's never, nothing's ever come of it. So I think that would be very interesting to see. It's a big thing to have to kick off. You know, it's, it's so long part of the game that you having that, that power, that, that sort of balance completely thrown to the wind would be a a kind of a big ask, both for, for weird, but also for the players. Um, You know, because we all have loyalties to factions and that, that would be undone essentially essentially yeah it would also potentially shake up the game a lot because if we introduce a new antagonist you'd need them represented in malifo the game in some way so yeah yeah very cool well thank you so much for your time this was awesome and uh i will like i said i'll link uh your socials as well as your own writing uh in the description below and uh if folks want to come and chat with you, you're also hanging out on my Discord occasionally and chat about lore stuff so everybody can come over and, uh, and say hi. Hi! <laughs> Huge thank you to the Extremely Cool Kids tier on Patreon, the Sea Powered Scoundrels, Dogmatize, Devin, and Spill Paint Pot. And thanks for watching.